So, um, like I said, you know, people today, when, when we think we're saved, when we know you're saved and everything, and uh, we say, well, you don't have to be baptized to be saved. Well, that might be true, and it is true, because look at the thief on the cross. He didn't come off the cross and was baptized before he went to heaven. Jesus told him, he said, what must I do to go to you, uh, with you into your kingdom? He says, he goes, believe on me, and he did. And he said, this day you shall be with me in paradise. And because he believed on the Lord Jesus Christ is why he went with Jesus into paradise. He said, this day thou shalt be with me in paradise. And uh, the, he didn't pull him off the cross to be baptized, did he? But, folks, Jesus was baptized, wasn't he? As we're going to learn in the following scriptures. And so because baptism doesn't save you doesn't mean it's not important. After all, Jesus was baptized by John. And uh, you wonder, have you ever wondered why Jesus had to be baptized? Think about it. The son of the living God has never sinned. He was sinless. So why did he need to be baptized? I'm glad you asked. And let's read the scripture and then we'll get back to that, okay? All right, Matthew chapter 3, starting with verse number 1. It says, In those days came John the Baptist. I mean, that wasn't by a church, church, church he belonged to, the Baptist church. I wonder why he was considered the Baptist. Was it because he was baptizing maybe? But anyway, John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So what's the important parts about salvation, folks, is repent. Turn from your sin, give it to God, and turn from it. Amen? Amen. All right. Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Why did he say the kingdom of heaven is at hand? Because Jesus has not died on the cross yet, right? And so he's saying here, hey, if you want to go to God's kingdom, you must be born again. And so for this, in verse 3, is he that was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying, the voice of one crying, in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord. Make his path straight. And the same John had his remnant of camel's hair. And this is what he wore. He wore camel hair and a leather girdle about his loins. And what did he eat? Ugh. Meat was locust and wild honey. The honey sounds pretty good, but I don't know about eating a, a locust. Do you? Whew, that's okay, though. I guess to get hungry, you eat anything, right? If you dip it in honey, it all tastes good. That's just like anything fried tastes good. But I have to say amen right there. <laughs> they even fry Oreos today. Then went out to him Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region around about Jordan and were baptized of him in Jordan, confessing their sins. Notice what they did. I'm a sinner. Lord, I'm a sinner. Save me. Amen. Hey, we got to confess our sins to him, folks. We're not all going to heaven because we think we're good. We think we're okay. You can't get to he uh, heaven on your own merit. For there's none righteous, no, not one. And we have to be born again through Jesus Christ, death, burial, and resurrection. And we're baptized of him and Jordan confessing their sins. Verse 7 now. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees, now this is the religious leaders, Come to his baptism, he said unto them, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bring forth therefore fruits, meat for repentance, and think not to say within yourselves, We have Abraham to our father, for I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. And verse 10, and now also the axe is laid unto the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree which bringeth not uh, forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Indeed, baptize you with water unto repentance. But he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. See, he's preaching. Christ is coming. And so he was the one who went before Christ, baptizing them, preparing the way for Christ and his ministry to come, whose fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor and gather his wheat. You know, the threshing floor, where they thresh the wheat, the, uh, the, uh, the good uh, wheat 
and the tares, they were separated in the end. And Jesus Christ, he's the one that comes, and he's going to separate the tares among the wheat, the, those who are saved from the lost, the sheep and the goats. Hey, it's up to Jesus to do it. My job is to, to preach the gospel. I'm not to say, hey, you're going to heaven, you're going to hell. I preach to you and I love you, but I don't love you. No, you're to preach the gospel and let whosoever will, let him come. Amen. And then it says here, whose fan is in his hand and he will thoroughly purge his floor and gather his wheat into the gatherer, but he will burn up the chafe with unquenchable uh, fire. Then cometh Jesus from Galilee to Jordan unto John to be baptized of him. But John forbade him, saying, I have no need to be baptized of thee, and comest thou to me? And Jesus answering and said unto him, Suffer it to be so, now for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he suffered him, and Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water, and lo, the heavens were open unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending, not as, not as a dove, but like a dove, and lightning upon him, and lo, a voice from heaven, this is the Father speaking, this is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. So why would Jesus need to be baptized then if he had no sin? He had no reason to repent. Well, it goes back to the Leviticus priest there uh, back in the Old Testament. What would they do before they offered up the sacrifice? They would wash themselves, right? And then they would take the sacrifice. What was Jesus preparing to do? To be the sacrifice once and for all. For whosoever will call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You see, he was that Lamb of God, folks, sent not to condemn the world. We quote John 3, 16 all the time about how God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believed in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Well, verse 17 says, He came not into the world to condemn the world, but the world through him might be saved. So he is the Lamb of God, sent from God to die to be buried and raised again on that third day as a fact, sacrificial lamb unto the Lord. And man, God gave me that a while ago when I was praying about this. I mean, it just touched me, you know, to think, you know, everything the Old Testament priest did, all the uh, furniture, everything in the temple of the tabernacle at that time, it had significance to pointing everything towards God and Jesus Christ in heaven. You know, nothing is by mistake in the Word of God. It's all pinned down, not by error. But everything in this Bible from the very beginning to the end is all pinned by God for His glory. Amen. And so praise be to God. And so um, Jesus was baptized, and He followed what He did. He came not to condemn the law or to do away with the law, but He came to fulfill the law. And because, you know, that's what they did in tradition and Jew uh, history, he uh, did it as well. But then he went to the cross of Calvary and changed it all, folks. Now we're not saved through a sacrifice of a little animal. But like I said, we are saved through the sacrifice of the only begotten Son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ. That's how we're saved once and for all. And I said it before, man, I'm so glad that I don't have to go before God in the Holy of Holies with a sacrificial animal and sprinkle that blood on the mercy seat because when Christ died on that cross, he went to heaven with his blood and sprinkled it on the mercy seat of the Father and said, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. And that's what he said when he was dying on the cross. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Folks, we've all sinned and come short of his glory. I have no reason to point a finger at any one of you because I got three pointing back at me, right? And that's what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to be witnesses, not judges, unto the saving grace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. For I'm not called to be a witness. I'm, a, I'm not called to be a judge, I mean. I'm called to be a witness. Let's get it right. There we go. So, Matthew 15. I'm going to flip there real quick. Verses 1 through 9, it says, Then came Jesus, scribes, and Pharisees, which were of Jerusalem, saying, Why do thy disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? For they wash not, and now we're talking about the washing, and it says, They wash uh, the elders, for they wash not their hands when they eat bread. But he answered and said unto them, Why do ye also transgress the commandment of God? 
by your tradition. For God commanded, saying, Honor thy father and mother, and he that curseth father or mother, let him die the death. But ye say, Whosoever shall say to his father and or mother, It is a gift by whatsoever thou mightest be profited by me. And honor not his father or his mother, he shall be free. Thus have ye made the commandment of God of none effect by your tradition. Ye hypocrites, boy, he called them what they were, didn't he? Well, he said, ye hypocrites, well did Isaiah's prophesy of saying, This people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth, and honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. You know, a lot of people like that today. Oh, they have lip service. They may come to church dressed like this in a nice suit or whatever. But what's up underneath those, that clothing, folks? What's behind those words? It's all in how you live your life. Is your heart right with God today, folks? You may fool the preacher. You may fool the congregation. But God knoweth the heart. You know, confess your sins. Confess your faults to him. And he will save you, folks. And that's why I say repent. For the kingdom of God is at hand. Just like John the Baptist. Repent. Jesus said repent. And so Jesus said it. We need to do it. Amen. In verse 9. But in vain they do worship me. Teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. And so uh, there again. They're talking about. Hey the disciples. They didn't wash before they ate. He's saying hey. You better check and see if your heart is right. That's what you need to be concerned about. How clean are you on the inside? And don't worry about the outward man because once the inward man is made right, the outward man will be right. Amen? People can tell when you are a Christian or not. I mean, it shows. It's what you talk about, who you talk about, what you do. I mean, if you're out here and you continue to do what you used to do before you ever got saved, I was wondering if there's ever conversion made. Because my Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. And that's what a representation of this water is, folks. That it's an inward faith. Hey, Jesus Christ went down on that cross. He went up on that cross for our sins. We go down that water as sinners. But when we come up, we're risen with Christ and his resurrection to a new life in him that our sins have been forgiven. And I'm telling the people out here, I'm part of this church body. I'm in, you know, not this church maybe, but in the body of Christ. He is the head. I'm here to follow him. And I'm making that a public expression today in front of everybody that believeth. And so why be baptized? Well, it's an act of obedience. Like I said, Jesus did it. We need to follow his example. Some of the last words Jesus spoke to his disciples were the threefold instruction. Make disciples, baptize those who believe, and teach them his commands. If we baptize for no other reason, we do it because Christ commands us to. We're to be obedient to what Christ says, folks. Jesus came to fulfill everything his father said, everything his father wanted him to do. You remember in the Garden of Gethsemane, uh, he was agonizing. He said, oh, that bitter cup. He seen all those sins that he was going to die for. Remember, he was sinless. He had never sinned. But he's thinking about, boy, I'm going to have all that sin on me, the past, present, and the future sins of the world on me. He's like, oh, that's so much filth and disgust. But, Father, not my will be done, but let thy will be done. And so he willfully laid down his life for you and I, folks, and raised it up again that you and I can enjoy salvation through none other than our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Then baptize, baptism is an opportunity to be a witness. The New Testament church and church history seem to indicate that baptism served as the initial profession of faith of early believers. After Philip preached Jesus to the Ethiopian, the new convert or believer's initial request was to be baptized in chapter 8. You remember Candace's uh, servant? He was in the chariot. He was reading the scriptures there. And what happened? Uh, he didn't understand, did he? And so Philip went over and said, uh, You understandeth what thou readest? He says, How can I understandeth unless I, uh, somebody explains it to me? And so Philip took and explained it to him. And then he says, what hinders me from being baptized? Look at this water right here. He says, nothing. So they went down into the water. Remember, they didn't sprinkle. He went down into the water, and they brought him up again. Amen? And so the Philippian uh, 
when the Philippian jailer responded to the preaching of Paul and Silas and believed in members of his family. You remember how the Philippian jailer got saved, went home and his household got saved? Hey, praise the Lord. Then that how salvation works? Landon, no telling what you can do, young man, through uh, God working in your life, buddy. And I'm not trying to point you out to embarrass you. I'm trying to say, hey, God's got his hand on you. God can use you in a mighty way. Don't think age has anything to do with it. You can reach people that this old preacher can't reach, and God's got his hand on you, and this is just the beginning of a new life. Amen? Hallelujah, folks. I don't know about y'all, but it excites me to see people born again and serving God. Amen? And so, they, family, they were baptized. Acts 16 and verse 33, they were baptized. The same is true for Lydia. You remember the cell of purple? Uh, she was bringing her masters much money. They got upset because she got saved. Well, she was uh, later baptized. This, then, in, uh, that's in the latter part of Acts 16, then Cornelius in Acts chapter 10, the Corinthians in Acts 18, and so many others, folks. Even you and I today, we were baptized to follow our Lord in believer's baptism to say, hey, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, but of the power of God unto salvation to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Amen. If we deny God, before men, he'll deny us before the Father because we're not ashamed. We go out and we live a life that's pleasing unto God that will bring people unto him. Oh, praise God. I work on a public job and I work for Central Health. And folks, you would think, hey, don't mention God around there. You'll get fired. You know what the men say? Pastor, pray this morning. We pray every morning before we start work. And I can see a difference, folks. Yes, we still get discouraged. And the Bible tells us, though, not to be discouraged and well-doing. One day we'll reap if we faint not. And I tell them, hey, yes, we'll get discouraged, but we got to keep our eyes on the Lord. He's the one that's going to take us to heaven. He's the one that we got to serve, and we got a responsibility to these people that we're taking care of. We're here for them because one day somebody might be taking care of us. Amen? So we need to be good to those that can't do for themselves. And then, uh, you know, we're to be a witness, folks. For these believers, baptism was a silent witness of an outward expression of their new faith and new way of life that they chose to serve Christ. How is baptism a witness and opportunity for us today? Our baptism is a witness to the saving work of Christ, his death, his burial, and his resurrection. Remember, he uh, got on the cross, we go down. That represents we are taking our sins they're being washed in his blood, not this water, but that's just a representation of what's happened on the inside. He's made new creatures out of us, and we gave them a brand new opportunity. Our slate is wiped clean, and we are raised to new life in the Lord Jesus Christ, to walk with him, to talk with him. And he tells me I am his own. Amen. And so Romans 6, 1 through 4 says, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Lord, no. God forbid, how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? No, verse 3 says, Know ye not that so many of us were baptized into his death? Therefore we are buried with him by baptism unto death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Baptism is symbolic then of Christ's death, burial, and resurrection, as I said a while ago. That's what it represents folks baptism does it's not that the baptism saves you but it's saying hey i understand that it was christ jesus that came into this world died for my sin was buried and raised again and he's got eternal life in his hand and he gives unto us eternal life folks isn't it good that this isn't all there is you know it won't always be like this will it so stay in the fight fight a good fight because there's a prize at the end amen and there's a crown, and you can win it. There's actually five crowns. You can win it. And see, when we get to heaven one day, isn't it going to be wonderful words that we hear directly from our Savior? Well done, thy good and faithful servant. Amen. Enter into your rest. Oh, it's not time to rest yet, folks. I know we say we got an extra hour today. But you know what? This old ticker right here and this mind of mine, I'm still under the old time. I woke up anyway. And so I didn't get an extra hour but I thank God. God's with me every hour. If man says, turn the clock back, turn the clock up, 
hey, man has nothing to do with when Jesus comes. No man knoweth when he comes, only God the Father. When he says, son, step out and get your bride. And the bride is the church, folks, the born-again believers. He's going to step out on that cloud. He's going to say, come up hither, my child. Well done, thy good and faithful servant. Enter into your rest. And then baptism is an open door into the church. The early church clearly took seriously the concept of church membership who were born again. Acts 2.47 tells us that the Lord added to the church daily. In Acts 2, we read where Peter's preaching of repentance brought over 3,000 souls to the Lord in one day. Man, can you imagine? I'd just like to have three souls come to the Lord right here today. Amen. Oh, that would tickle this old preacher to death. But you know, you don't get saved for the preacher's sake. You get saved because you get under conviction. And you realize, hey, I want to please God, not man anymore. I've been a man pleaser too long. God, I want to please you. I want to accept what you give me, that free gift of salvation, none other than through your son, Jesus Christ. And be born again, folks. In Acts 2, we read where Peter's preaching of repentance brought over 3,000 souls to the Lord, and they that were saved got baptized, and that was in verse 41 of Acts. And uh, there are two obedience or, or ordinances, I should say, that Jesus has committed to the church, or should I say commission to the church. You know what they are? Baptism and the Lord's Supper. Those two things were to do until Jesus comes. And so when a new believer in Jesus Christ is baptized, we, the church, need to get behind the new believer and disciple them. You know, that's what happens. So many people confess, you know, their sins to Jesus Christ, and they uh, get saved, they get baptized, and then we just leave them out here. You know, that's just like taking a newborn babe and birthing them into this world and say, all right, you're on your own. Train up a child in the way they should go. When they're old, they will not depart from it. Train. Teach them. You know, be there as an example before them. Don't throw them out here to the wolves and then talk about, well, look at this one. You know, I knew he would never be nothing. Or look at Sally over here. I knew she wouldn't amount to nothing. Look at her. Folks, like I said, we're not judges. We're witnesses and we're teachers and we'll make disciples out of them. And a disciple is somebody that's been taught the word of God to go out into the world to, uh, to, to compel people to come in. Amen. But it's up to us, the older generation, to teach the younger generation and then the next generation teach the next generation. What are we going to do if we don't get youth into the church and get them involved in witnessing and preaching and teaching and uh, studying God's word, folks? The church is going to die out. Oh, I thank God for what he's done here, folks. He's kept us here. Not that we can just get behind these walls and keep the word of God to ourselves, but he's compelled us to go out and tell others about him. And that's what it's all about is spreading the gospel out here into a lost and dying world. You know, one day, the gospel's going to be spread all about. Sarah and I and Janet and Pat were talking last night at the house, you know, about how that uh, you were telling me somebody had, was getting these Bibles printed in all languages so it can reach all through the jungles, all across the world. And when that word of God has reached, the gospel has reached everywhere. Hey, folks, I'm listening for that trumpet to sound. Amen. It's coming. He's coming. Amen. The coming of the Lord is coming. And so, remember, we're to baptize, we're to do the Lord's Supper. And as we do that Lord's Supper, we're to do it till he comes. To re it resembles what he did. He gave his life on the cross of Calvary. He shed his blood for the New Testament church. And we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you are saved. The Bible says, 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And so the Bible says here in Matthew 28, 19, and 20, Go ye therefore and teach all nations. All nations, folks. You say, we are the USA. We're the greatest nation there ever was. Folks, I tell you what, uh, pride cometh before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. Maybe that's why God's allowing us to go through what we're going through right now because we're reaping the benefit uh, of what we sow. And we sowed some seed out there of pride, and we've gotten too big. And God said, hey, 
humble yourselves before me and repent and turn back to me and I will bless, I will uh, forgive you of your sins. If you repent, I will heal your land again. Amen. But we must repent as individuals, as a nation. God, forgive us. We are the USA. We love this country. We don't like what it's becoming. But God, we love this country because we first loved you. And Lord, you gave us this country to take care of it, to represent you. This is a country that's always served you. And God, that's why our forefathers came here to the uh, United States, was they could freely serve you. And it's not under the government's law and what they say, who we have to serve, the way we have to serve you, and anything else. And that's where the separation of church and state comes in, folks, because at one time, the state was telling the church what they had to believe. And that just separates us from that. We believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and him alone. Amen for salvation. Anyway, I'm not going to get political, remember. And it says, go teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. Even to the end of the world. Folks, God destroyed this world once by flood. And he made that rainbow not as a symbolism of some kind of movement or gay right or anything else. But he did it to show forth his promise that he would never flood the whole earth again by water. But one day it will be uh, destroyed by fire. And there will be a new heaven. There will be a new earth. And uh, there will be a place of peace and uh, happiness where there'll be no more tears, no more pain, no more suffering. It'd be a place where uh, Jesus will be and uh, we can be with our loved ones that know the Lord forever and forever and forever. And it won't be like it is down here, amen. And so that's why we should be baptized. And I hope it brought it down to you to where if you wanna be baptized, please let me know, I'll baptize you here. All you gotta do is know the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and I will baptize you to make sure that you've been baptized. Like I say, it's nothing to be ashamed of. Man, it just makes you feel so refreshed that you follow Christ and that you're not ashamed of him. Remember, he was not ashamed of you. He loved you so much that he died on that cross for you, was buried, raised again on that third day, that whosoever will call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's not my word, but that's God's word. Amen.